good evening uh, and welcome to the ICIE talks. Today we have Professor Arthur Kokatz and he is going to talk about crisis management, a global uh, perspective. Uh, Arthur is the director of the World Innovation Team, an international consulting firm located south of Los Angeles, California, with a branch office in Bangkok, Thailand. And this is the website for uh, World Innovation. Uh, he has 35 years of university teaching experience with 85% of that at the graduate level. Today, he teaches and does corporate training for a variety of institutions and firm, firms worldwide. Originally, Arthur Cook is from New York City, and he has taught in 23 different countries worldwide, lectured at 37 institutions and lived and worked in North America, Europe, South America, and Asia. His specialty is creativity and innovation in business. And he has more than 50 articles and three books on that subject. The most widely read, Business Creativity, Breaking the Invisible Barriers, published by Belgrave Macmillan. And he has been, or oh, oh, that book has been translated into Russian and Chinese. He is a frequent speaker at international conferences on business and education. This ICIE talks shed light on one of the most important and interesting workshops. This progressive workshop enables you to better deal with the crisis in your life by helping you understand what happens before, during and after a crisis. A crisis represents a change you were ready for. To deal with it, you have to be able to shift gears. There is no time for traditional step-by-step -step methods. Instead, you have to go from where you are to where you need to be. And this demands changes in your thinking. This workshop analyzes the current COVID-19 crisis and allows participants to learn from what has been done and also what has not been done. This workshop looks at the crisis from a global perspective. Professor Kokatz has taught in 23 countries worldwide and has unique experience in giving participants a holistic view of unprecedented global crisis. Most seminars prepare participants to deal with yesterday's problem, but this is up to the minute workshop enables you to deal with the issue of today and prepares you for tomorrow. In brief, we invite you today to join the ICIE talks and learn about this important topic. Then if you are interested, you could join the World Innovation Team to become qualified in this field. Welcome again, Dr. Kokatz in this talk. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm very, I'm very pleased to be with you today and to be able to talk to you about crisis management. Um, I want to make just some points uh, because the talk is not that long and we don't, and it's a big subject. Um, first point, are you prepared for a crisis? Uh, are you, how about a firm and how about a government? The answer is usually no, no, and no. Uh, we're not usually individually prepared. I mean, most people, one of the big problems is, is if the electricity today goes off. If you don't have it for a while, okay. But if it gets to be longer than that, you're going to have a problem getting money. You're going to have a problem getting food. When you teach supply chain, like I do, you start to ask uh, yourself, what are you dependent on? And the answer is you're dependent on others for almost everything. Uh, and with that, very little that you can really prepare for if there is a major crisis. Um, how about governments? Well, most governments in the world 
were not prepared for the COVID crisis. Now, of course, today we're going to talk about COVID-19 because the crisis is overwhelming, but we're also going to talk about a lot of other crises and, and what we're talking about today. You can um, adapt and uh, bring into almost any different crisis. Um, some years ago, the government in Japan had an earthquake and then a tsunami. Of course, as you probably remember, they were prepared for the earthquake because they do get many. They were not prepared for the tsunami, even though they had had one a hundred years before. Uh, most people, and this is individuals, firms, and governments are not prepared for a crisis. Uh, what we can say is in a crisis, though, hope is not a strategy. And it's interesting. I saw an article yesterday, and, and it was in the Bangkok Post. And this, what I have on the screen now, comes from that article. And the first paragraph is talking about the government of Thailand at the moment. And it says, well, if you were a government and you had a failing economy, much less tax revenue, uh, and problems down the line, and you can read what it says, feeble economic relief programs, what would you do? And the answer is you'd give people hope. Um, this is what we tend to do. What's this mean? Well, first off, we're not really prepared for a crisis. And then when we do get into one, we have a tendency to uh, rely on hope. Well, hope is wonderful. Hope we need all the time, but hope is not a strategy. And unfortunately, many governments and many firms rely on hope because that's what we sort of have been trained to do. Now, risk management is prevention of a crisis and crisis management is dealing with the crisis. And it's true that it's easier and doctors will tell you, this is just an example, uh, it's easier to prevent someone from getting sick than it is to cure them once they are sick. And there's an example from ancient China. In, at that time, you paid the doctor when you were healthy. And you didn't pay the doctor when you were sick. Why? Well, it was the doctor's job to keep you healthy and if you were sick, doctor wasn't doing his job, so why pay him? Well, that's the opposite of what we do today. Today, we pay the doctor only when we're sick. In fact, we visit the doctor only when we're sick. Do you know what that's called? It's called crisis management. It's true. Most of the time, we only go to the doctor when there's a problem. Doctor only deals with that problem they don't usually get involved in why did you get this pain or why do you have these symptoms? Most of it is give you medicine, cure what you came for, boom, that's all. Okay, why? Well, first off, there's not a lot of money in prevention. For money is in crisis management and it's also in dispensing medicine, pharmaceuticals. I remember when I lived in France and I lived in France for 15 years, lived and worked there. And when I visited the doctor, especially the, the general doctor, but almost any, in the waiting room, most of the time, there were good looking women, really tall, well-dressed, and I always said, I'm a bit naive. I always said, wow, who are these women that you always see in the doctor's offices? And of course, they were the representatives of the pharmaceutical companies. And they would visit the doctors to push the doctor into prescribing their company's medicine. And the doctors would get mm, free things, free trips, perks, if they prescribed enough of that medicine. Well, usually what's happening is 
and we'll see more and more today, um, it's easier to stop a crisis before it happens. But if you prevent the crisis, you have nothing to take credit for. Why? Nobody knows. <laughs> so politicians don't always like to prevent crisis because they can't really say, hey, look what I did. Risk management and prevention of crisis is easier than dealing with it. But we don't really do this. Uh, we're not good at it. Let's put it that way. Good question. Why aren't we better prepared for the crisis that come up in our lives? One of the big reasons is what they call ROI, which is return on investment. And this comes from business. It means you do something only because you're going to get a return. You do something for a reason. You do something for money. That's basically what it comes from. And companies always say, no return on investment. Why should we do that? Uh, one of the classic uh, examples I can give you is McDonald's. Uh, back in the 1970, the entrepreneur uh, who we associate with McDonald's, his name was Ray Kroc at the time, he said, well, we should put in a play area in the McDonald's restaurants for the kids because our target market are families and children. And all the execs said, Ray, you can't do that. There's no return on investment. If you want to put in a bigger dining area, okay. If you want to do something that brings in money, okay. But a play area is not going to do that. Well, Croc pushed it through and it was quite successful, as many of the things McDonald's did. On this slide, I put up a quote from Donald Trump, former U.S. president, who said, because uh, Trump, when he got into office, got rid of the pandemic response team that the U.S. had. And when he was asked why later, he was asked why he did this. He said, I'm a businessman. I don't like paying people to do nothing. Why aren't we prepared? Because most of the time, it's not necessary. Because most of the time, I mean, let's put it, let me, put it in other terms for you. I used to have a friend. He was a dean of a business school in the US. Very nice guy. He brought with him to work every day a big black umbrella. I was always amazed because he always had this black umbrella every day. Did he use it every day? No, because it didn't rain every day but he brought it with him, carried it with him all the time, every day. He was always prepared for the rain. But most of the time, the sun was out. You didn't need it. And this is the problem with a crisis. Most of what we prepare for, and it be, can be time, it can be money, not necessary. And so we don't. Now, this is one of the first points I want to make, and that is, a crisis is not a normal event. It seems normal, but it's not. I equate it to Alice in Wonderland. That's why I put that up on the slide. Um, Wonderland was very similar to the real world, but it was different, not the same. And that means a crisis is very similar to a non-crisis, but it's different. And that means that you can't really apply normal methods and normal thinking. And this is one of the big issues in crisis management. You've got to think and deal with it differently. This is true, comes from decision-making. It says all our information is about the past, but all our decisions are about the future. True. What happens in a crisis? We immediately go to the past. 
What happened with COVID? Well, they compared it initially. This goes back to March 2020, February and March. They compared it to the flu. They compared it to SARS. It was totally different. But since they had no really, didn't have anything that they could really compare it to, they compared it to what they knew. And that in a crisis can be a problem. It can, be, it can work sometimes, but most of the time, it's better to look at the problem or the crisis with fresh eyes rather than immediately go and look at the past. Decision-making, creativity, logic, critical thinking, ideation. Look at these. All of these are important in business, in life, and in crisis management. None of these really are taught very much or very well in school. I've taught in 23 different countries. The only countries where they asked me to teach decision-making was in Europe. A couple of the European countries asked me to teach decision-making. No other countries have. Creativity, yeah, it's more popular today. Logic, whoa. I've never really had students who've studied logic, critical thinking, neither. Ideation, oh my God. So how do we learn this? I mean, we just said we're not prepared for a crisis. And then we're also not prepared in our preparation and in our education. And that reflects in our leaders. I mean, look at leadership. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Um, most leaders are not equipped to deal with a crisis. In fact, they say, which is true, no world leader today was put there or got there because they were good at a crisis. If we equate this to sports, well, we should learn something. Look at what happens in sports. A sports team brings in different players when something happens in the game that needs a change. We don't do this in politics and in government. A crisis happens. Do we change leadership and put in people who are good at crisis management? Absolutely not. We keep the same leaders as before the crisis. Are they good at crisis management? Sometimes, yes. Sometimes, absolutely not. So therefore, you need luck. And we can look at COVID. Some of the world leaders have done better than others, sure. Not all leaders will be good in a crisis. No experience, really. No expertise, no training. Most leaders hope a crisis will ne never happen on their watch. That's true. Now, I'm not going to get into, because that's subjective, which leaders did better in COVID than others. I think if you look at what happened, I think it's obvious some did well and some didn't. One of the points I'd like to make, though, is that leadership in a crisis does not get you popularity. It doesn't get you good points, and it doesn't get you reelected. Usually, leaders after a crisis who were very good and got their uh, countries through the crisis. If we look at an example, I'll give you Churchill in World War II, who really helped bring England through the war. After the war, he was out. Why? Most of what you need to do in a crisis will not be popular. And any world leader who wants to be reelected or who wants to be thought good of is usually useless in a crisis. Now, this is a small little exercise and I put it up only because I mentioned critical thinking and logic. And this is true. 
in a crisis, you need to think differently. Remember, we said we can't really do normal thinking. We need different thinking. Okay. So we need to be capable of different thinking. Okay. As I was saying, this is critical thinking, and it's only a, a short little exercise. Uh, it says you enter a bedroom, there are 34 people. You kill 30. Now, how many are in the bedroom? Well, when you show this to, because I show this occasionally to a, to a class, uh, normal answers tend to be, uh, well, four or five. Uh, sometimes a little more. That's because we make assumptions. This is very similar to logic, which I, I mentioned to you, most people don't study. Um, we assume this is a story because the sentences are put together. You enter a bedroom, 34 people. Ah, ah, uh -uh, wait a minute. You enter a bedroom, period. There are 34 people. It doesn't say there are 34 people in the bedroom. Just as 34 people. Now you assume, well, there must be because, oh, uh, okay. You kill 30. It doesn't say you kill 30 people. Now, how many are in the bedroom? It doesn't say how many people are in the bedroom. So in almost every sentence here, we assume a story, but that's not really what this is. Answer, how many are in the bedroom? We don't know. Critical thinking, like logic, asks us to look at something differently. And in a crisis, because again, I mentioned, in a crisis, it looks normal, but it's not normal. Therefore, if you apply normal thinking, you probably will have trouble. This is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, it comes from creativity, really, because it's a basis of creativity. It says, it's difficult to paint a rose. This is a quote from Henri Matisse, a French artist. He says, it's difficult to paint a rose because in order to do so, you have to forget all the other flowers you've seen and look upon this one flower as if you're looking at it for the very first time. This is important for crisis management. Crisis management, you've got to take it out of context and look at it as an event which is unique. You can't look at it as an extension of what you know and do and live with. Yes, it looks like it. Yes, it's very similar, but no, it's not the same. Drop the past. Uh, I mentioned this a little bit. The World Health Organization, uh, initially with COVID, compared it to the flu. And their conclusion in March of 2020 was, the flu is more dangerous. Why? Because it's more easily transmissible. Uh, okay. That sort of screwed up a lot of things because people in the beginning said, well, this will be over in a month or two. No, we're a year and a half and we still don't see the end of it. Uh, they said, oh, well, it's not that bad. Yes, it was. Uh, but they really didn't or weren't able to understand what this was. The thing that makes COVID, of course, more dangerous than most diseases is not everyone who has it looks and feels sick. Therefore, any normal, healthy, apparently healthy human being can kill you. That's never really happened before. Most all diseases, we can say, oh, him, yeah, he feels sick, he is sick. But now, no, he doesn't feel sick, he doesn't look sick, but he can still infect me and I can die. 
Go back to crisis management. And again, as I'm saying, I'm making a few points and stressing a few things. To get what you want, you have to give up something you also want. This is a very important statement. They use it in business all the time. But it's true. In crisis, you're not going to get everything you want. You got to be ready to make concessions and ready to really say what is the priority. That's why I put that title of this slide, Priorities. Well, honestly, deciding what's important and most important is the most basic and fundamental thing in an MBA program. That's mostly what MBA students learn, how to judge what's important and what's not. And in a crisis, that is really, really critical. Example comes from Singapore and COVID. Um, Singapore, like many of the countries in Southeast Asia, Thailand also, has a lot of uh, migrant workers or uh, occasional workers. Um, they work for less money and usually they come from other countries. And an official in Singapore, because Singapore has done well comparatively with, with COVID, was asked why the government did not foresee uh, the spread of the virus amongst the foreign workers who live in very cramped conditions in dormitories. They do this because they wanna make as much money as they can and take it home or send it home. Thailand has the same problem now. They didn't learn from Singapore. The answer that the official in Singapore gave was, we couldn't tell 200,000 workers not to go to work because they might become ill. We could only tell them once it was clear that they would become ill. And there's one other sentence on the slide. It says, if you wait to hear the gunshot, bang, it's too late. This is the problem with a crisis. You're dealing with things that are not clear, that are not proven, that are not accepted. And that's what you got to work with. Strategy, of course, depends on the situation, resources, and obstacles. But this is the important part. You don't have time for test what you're going to do. You don't have time. Let's see if this works. You got to be able to look at a situation, developing situation, and see it holistically. Also, you need a strategy that works today and also tomorrow. And this is one of the major problems with crisis management. People do just enough. Why? Because just enough is the foundation of business. I mean, this is supply chain. You want just enough merchandise to meet the demand. You want just enough workers to be there. Not too much, otherwise you lose money. Not, not, don't also have it so that you can't supply the products or the workers. But in a crisis, just enough won't be enough tomorrow or the next day. Why? Because the crisis is usually expanding. Therefore, you always have to overreact, not underreact. This is advice from Formula One. And it's very simple advice. When you have a Formula One race car, usually they have 10 speeds. You know, when you shift gears, this, these are not automatic cars, you have to shift them. And they have 10 gears. And usually the advice that's given to a Formula One driver is you don't go through the gears, one, two, three, four, five, six, or if you're in eighth gear, you don't go seven, six. You go from the gear you're in to the one you need. Which means you don't always go in sequence. You don't have time. Only give more when it's enough. That's what most people do. 
they do something which is just enough. <gasps> Didn't work. Okay, well, I'll do a little more. Uh, not enough. Okay, I'll give a little more. The key to crisis management is you go much further than you need to initially because that's where you're going to probably end up anyway. So what you're doing again is making unpopular decisions. Why? Most people say, well, we don't know that. Of course you don't know that. You don't have time to know that. One of the interesting things today is, it's a quote from Jeff Bezos, of, a former CEO of Amazon, who said, today the average CEO makes all their decisions with a maximum of 50% data, never more. There's never enough time. This is crisis management. You never really have enough time and you're never sure. And that has to be okay. Holistic view, I mentioned this a little bit already, you need a holistic view of an uncertain or developing situation. It's about transparency, it's about speed, and of course, data from multiple sources, not just one. So it's a question of getting as much data as you can, but not waiting to get more and more and getting a consensus and seeing how it develops You've got to sort of go more, and I will throw the word out, but it's true. Intuition in decision-making then comes into play. What you do has to work is another point. In normal times, leaders only have to show that they did something. It's true. They don't have to show that it worked. Example, well... Let's say government says, well, everyone needs to wear a face mask. Okay. Then the mayor or the governor says, everybody needs to wear a face mask. Fine. But then the people don't. The governor said, well, I just said they have to. But enforcement, that's somebody else's job. So I did my job. And a lot of leaders under COVID have said, okay, um, in the U.S., for example, they said anybody who enters Los Angeles from outside of L.A., hmm, you, you're supposed to quarantine. Well, that's impossible. They said anybody who enters New York State from outside of the state at one point has to quarantine. That's impossible to enforce. And they knew it. And they did it, but it really serves no purpose other than saying, I did that. I did my job. That's all. Don't bother me. In a crisis, what you do has to work. And this is the difficult thing. And one of the things you probably will understand very quickly already is leadership and crisis management are really, really linked and they're really, really important. If you don't have the right leaders, good luck. Historically, some countries have tried to cover up or play down crisis because they didn't want what they were doing to be interrupted. Um, one of the big examples is Japan with the Olympics. Initially, Japan did not really want to come down too hard and give too much uh, attention to COVID because they didn't want to lose the Olympics. And they're still pushing it through. There's been a lot of people in Japan, <clears throat> a lot of the people who said, no, cancel it. But they've invested too much in it. Um, same thing for Thailand with tourism. And initially, they tried to play it down. Trump did uh, because of political purposes. He thought it was bad for him in terms of the election. So he tried to say, what crisis? Modi in India did similar. Um, 
in a crisis, you need to be real. You need to say, this is what's happening. It probably won't be good news. It probably is not going to please a lot of people, but you can't avoid the reality. And um, this is so many cases of it. I mean, you can give example after example of countries who try to play it down because it's not really uh, what we want. One other small example of this came from the US early in COVID, it goes back to February um, 2020. They have a big carnival in the US. It happens in a city called New Orleans. It's a same carnival that they have in Venice and Rio. And it brings in big money and it's a big event. And back in February, COVID was just starting to spread in the US. And Venice canceled their carnival. And New Orleans didn't. Why? Because they didn't really see enough cases in the US. And of course, since they went and did it and they brought in all the money, et cetera, but it also um, brought a lot of suffering and a lot of more disease. So, a lot of this comes out to priorities. People are going to want to uh, protect their own interests and what they have been working on. The governments will always say, yeah, avoid panic. China initially didn't tell the world this was an airborne disease. It makes a big difference. They told some people, but that Trump for one thing sat on that information. The U.S. also initially said, no, you don't need to wear face masks. And that screwed up a lot of people. Why did they do that? Because they were afraid if they said you need to wear a face mask, that there wouldn't be enough face masks for the doctors. So in order to protect the hospitals, they said to the general population, no, this is not necessary. And then later when they said, yes, you need to, people said, yes, but you told us it wasn't necessary. So what? Well, now we don't understand what the heck you're doing. Yes, you need to avoid a panic and a larger crisis. But remember, deal with reality. If you don't do it today, you're going to have to do it tomorrow. And this goes back to preventive medicine. Remember, the doctors say, easier to prevent you from getting sick than to cure you. But we don't usually practice preventive medicine. It's a good question. Uh, it says when you argue with your partner, your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, girlfriend, what do you usually do? And you have a choice of four things. Double down. Mm, I'm right. Stay silent. Mm, don't do anything. Just a couple of days of shut up. Compromise. Apologize right away. It doesn't matter who is right or wrong. Well, in creativity and in crisis management, number four, it doesn't matter who was right or wrong. What you don't want to do in a crisis is start to blame. That's the problem. You are the problem there. You just want to solve the crisis. Once you blame, you shut people down. Once you judge, you shut people down. In a crisis, you need help. My wife used to say something very good. She said, if you have a problem, tell everybody you know. Somebody will help. We don't do that. In a crisis, you need everybody. You need help. Ask for it. And don't judge or blame because you're going to alienate some people and shut them down. What's your role? Are you part of the solution or part of the problem? You may not be. Therefore, if you're not in a position to help, get out of the way. 
get the people who can help the best in charge, which means leaders need to be able to step aside. I don't say step down. I say step aside. Go back to sports. In a game, you may get substituted. That doesn't mean you're a bad player or <clears throat> it just means in this instance, maybe somebody was better than you. They have specialists in sports. They don't have specialists in government for crisis. They don't. It's the same team no matter what. Are you willing to take decisions that might be unpopular, risking your image or reputation to solve the crisis? You can't stop a crisis and also look good. You're not going to make friends. You're not going to win fans. If you want to get out of the way, it's not going to work. One of these almost finished because I know we're running a little bit. Well, we're, I think we're okay on time, just a little bit. Um, watch out for loopholes. Watch out for special treatment. Uh, ah, okay. Everybody has to quarantine. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. But um, maybe not the staff. Uh, maybe not the family of the staff. Maybe not the VIPs. Um couple of countries I know since I, I know a little more about Thailand maybe than some of the other countries here uh, early in COVID they weren't asking the military to, to quarantine they were asking everybody else Hong Kong did the same thing they didn't ask the pilots in, at one point and that was a loophole so be careful there's always going to be people in a crisis who say ah I'm an exception no, because the loopholes really can be a big, big problem. Um, benefits of a crisis? Okay. These are not normal times. And because of it, you can do things and push through solutions that normally people wouldn't accept. Because it's a different time, you need to think differently. And that can be good. Don't look upon a crisis as being totally negative. Um, there's also benefits usually. Some people get rich. Um, you only get to decide two things or a few things in life. How you react. And your reaction in a crisis is very important. Um, you need to react quickly. You need to react um, not hesitant with confidence. If it's, don't worry about whether you're right or wrong. Just give it your best shot. That's basically what crisis is all about. Because there's a sense of urgency and uh, you can't really just try and test. You've got to go for more than that. Uh, okay, conclusions. Crisis requires special strategy and tactics. No time to test the waters. Holistic view of a developing situation, which is probably the most difficult. Not everyone around you is going to help. Your actions need to be more than just enough. Do more than you think and priorities take precedence. Okay, now. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Arthur. I know it is around thank midnight you. at your side now. So it's only, it's only 11 p.m., but yeah, it's okay. Yeah, okay. So thank you so much for this interesting talk. And uh, we will uh, remind people again that this is all about a workshop because uh, Arthur tried uh, just to give a brief description what should be done when we have a crisis. And he was talking about different factors and about different ways to deal with a crisis. 
uh, according to a holistic approach. And uh, uh, also, I would like to say again, uh, if you are interested to communicate with Arthur, so you have, uh, we have the email, we can connect you uh, with him and uh, then you can benefit from such uh, unique work. So now we will have uh, questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and then I will en enable everybody to unmute. So if you are interested to ask, will you please raise your hand? Any question? Yes, uh, Mr. Abdel Fattah. Yes, uh, Yeah, please. thank you very much for this uh, very informative and very useful uh, uh, presentation. Uh, when you are trying to address, say, or solve crisis, there is also an expectation that you talk to the stakeholders of what you are planning to do or um, uh, how much this is going to cost them, whether it's this time, uh, maybe inconvenience or something like that. How do you um, how do you handle that? What would be the advice in order to communicate? You are trying to figure out what to do, but people expect you to tell them what you are planning to do. You got my point, well, Arthur? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, first off, you you raised a very good point. Uh, and that is communication. And that's, I didn't put that really in the, in the talk tonight. But one of the things that's really important in a crisis is that, that, that you communicate what you're doing. Uh, and good communication is something that the, the people and the, and the coworkers need. Uh, planning is another topic. A lot of companies and governments, they do scenario planning. But what happens is a lot of times the plans are outdated. The people have changed. No one knows where the plan is. No one's read it. And so usually when the crisis comes up, the existing plans usually are not that um, helpful. Um, so I would say be ready for everything, but don't worry about having a detailed plan for something because when the crisis hits, the plan probably won't fit. Um, but you need to be flexible and you need before the crisis to say who's going to help, who's not going to help and sort of really think about it. I mean, I asked my students when I teach, I said, when you came into this room, did you look to see where the exits are? Did you look to see how you can get out of this building in case there's a bomb or a fire? Everybody says, of course not. Well, okay. This is something you sort of do when you go into a place, you look where the exits are. I mean, I, I've, I used to take an international flight every month before COVID. So I fly a lot. I would always sit in the emergency exit row every flight. Why? If there was a problem, I want to be the first one off the plane. I don't want to be stuck in the back. Okay, so you need planning, but you don't have a real detailed plan for everything. That's the best answer I can give you. Uh, my Thank you very much. So I appreciate it. Quick question. Yeah, if yeah, you don't yes. mind. Uh, no. I see. May I? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, okay, let us look at it from the other side. The okay. leader is trying their best, assemble their team. They are trying to solve crisis. Okay, a leader of a government, there is food shortage, this crisis, and things like that. But also with the social media, everybody with a smartphone, they think that they can solve the crisis, they can solve it and groups and uh, so there is a barrage of suggestions. How do you, how do you handle that? Uh, put filters, uh, uh, monitors, it is crazy because everything that the, uh, the president or this person is not doing the right thing, we know. Oh, and these are the suggestions. So how, how uh, what, do you, what is your advice say, for a leader when that say an opinionated nation with 
the barrage of this social media stuff coming every second from around the globe. Yeah. You have a very good question and a big question and not an easy one to answer. But uh, let me offer the following. This may not be a popular answer also. Um, under COVID, what they've seen is some of the best reactions have been China. Um, China sees about five cases and they test 10 million people and they lock down the huge cities. The West, Europe is incapable of doing that. Um, they have found that in a really big crisis, uh, authoritarian decisions work better than democracy or mm -hmm. uh, letting people just do what they want. I mean, when you look at COVID, what did most of the West say? Okay, you, you may have been exposed, therefore go home and self-quarantine. Huh? And Hong Kong found most of the people that they said self-quarantine never did it. Ah, okay. But they were not capable of really enforcing that. China was. Some countries were. Those countries did better than the ones that sort of left everybody on their own. So while we always say yes, democracy and freedom of choice and everybody be taking care of themselves works, it's also to a large degree chaos. And that's why usually leaders who are successful in a crisis are not popular. And after the crisis finished, the democracies kick them out. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Thank you for the question. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And uh, who would like? Dr. Nasser, you raised your hand and then no question. Okay. There is somebody asking about how could we get, you know, the public involved in the preparation process or, you know, in preparation in general and the prevention in particular? Well, that's an that's a excellent question. I think in general, we need to push more prevention. Uh, you need to do more risk management. And even in, in terms of healthcare, preventive medicine, we don't do that. We don't exercise enough. We don't eat well. We, we are on ourselves don't, we have too much stress. We don't deal with prevention really. Uh, and if it's, it's actually very telling because what they found under COVID is most of the people who are very sick also have other underlying conditions like diabetes, like um, high blood pressure, like heart disease that they have been carrying with them for years, which means almost everybody is carrying some problems. We haven't dealt with those problems. And so it comes out to most of the time, we make minor uh, adjustments. We don't do structural change. Structural change means change your lifestyle. I mean, honestly, when I, I'm thin, I've been thin most of my life. But when I was younger, I was heavier. Not fat, but heavier. And I couldn't lose weight. And finally, you know how I lost weight? I quit my job. True. And then I was happy and ah, okay, I lost the weight easily. Why? Because I played sports and I was doing things. <gasps> okay, so you may have to do that. We don't do that. We just try to put a bandage on things. We go on a diet. No, that doesn't work. And so, yeah, we need to be able to do those kinds of things. Uh, what was the question again? Because I got sidetracked. Yeah, uh, uh, Laura was asking that, how could we get the public uh, be involved, yeah. you know, in the I, preparation okay. in general and uh, yeah. prevention? I, 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 I think the solution is ask. Um, oh. Ask. We don't ask people to get involved. 
uh, you know, um, we but don't leaders, say, okay, you know, leaders know give us ideas. Better. I mean, yeah. we, we don't ask for ideas. We don't ask for volunteers. We don't say, okay, who wants to get involved to help solve the next crisis? Uh, no. And we don't get involved in government. And they don't want us involved either most of the time. And so uh, I think the whole way to do it is get more people uh, behind you. You can get people on board, but you have to bring them on board. Most people think you don't want me, which is true. Go up to people, talk to them and engage them. Most of the time, no. We live, even though we have social media, I mean, I always ask my students, I say to them, seriously, I say, oh, how many friends did you make yesterday? I don't mean friends on Facebook, that don't count. How many friends did you make? None. You know, statistically, after the age of 26, the average person makes three or four friends for the rest of their life. Oh my God. Really? Why? Because we don't reach out to people, reach out to them. I think good leaders do that. Most of the time, we don't do that. But you know, uh, Arthur, now I would like yeah. to comment and I would like to ask you. Please. As you know, uh, we were educated that leaders can think on behalf of us. So we don't need to think first. Second, they decide on behalf of us. So we have no ability to make decisions. In addition to that, when it comes to critical thinking, it is forbidden. You were talking about generating ideas. Now we are talking about different types of countries because we are talking about developed and developing countries. So do you think it is the quality of educational systems? I think so. I think it's a, it's, it's a lot to do with education. Um, most of my students are there for the paper, honestly. They don't ask enough questions. They don't really get involved. Um, they, to a large degree, are struggling uh, just to take care of themselves. And they don't have a certain social um, presence. And we've developed that. Why? Well, because in, de in developing countries, a small group of people decide and hold all the power. Uh, and that's the way they want it. And um, that part has got to change. Uh, I mean, I think in Thailand, you, I think statistically, half of 1% owns almost all the wealth. Uh, and even in the developing countries, you have a big divide between the ones who have and the ones who don't. And the ones who have don't really want to share. Um, they, they, they did a, an exercise where they asked people, um, if you found a genie, you know, like Aladdin, the blue genie, what would you ask for? Well, the number one answer is money, a lot of money. But only if 10% of the population would ask for money for everybody. Otherwise, me, my genie, my money. And for the other people, no, 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 no. And this is sort of the way we're brought up. Uh, brought up to make it and you make it at the expense of others. And that, um, that's not really the best way. So in terms of... Uh, what we're looking at, you need a lot of change in order really to deal with the crisis because we are not ready for the next one. And most people are saying this. And my last question, and also after that, we will conclude. Do you Thank think, you. Arthur, that uh, this pandemic will make a paradigm shift? This pandemic is... Um, really transformative in that it is bigger than anybody thought it, it would ever be. It's not over. And we don't know how it's going to end, honestly. And this, uh, almost two years into it, is incredible. Because if you had said we're going to shut down the world, mainly in terms of mobility, no, it's impossible. 
No, it's not impossible. So I think this is going to change uh, so many things. And yet it's not because people are just waiting to go back to the same way. Uh, and for some people, it hasn't really changed very much. I think what it showed is uh, that governments need to work together because they are not. And people need to uh, be less selfish because when anything breaks down, uh, it's me against you. And that's not, again, going to help the world. The only way we can get out of this pandemic is to vaccinate everybody. But look at what's happening. It's not happening. And that, of course, is quite telling. So at the end of this talk, I would like to thank you so much, Arthur, for your continuous uh, valuable contributions uh, at the international level uh, in general and with ICIE and looking forward to keep thank you. Uh, this link and this cooperation forever. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. I, I love to be able to work with you and to reach your audience. And if anybody has any questions, please do contact me. Uh, I'm happy to answer everybody. Thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate thank your you. time tonight. Thank you. Now, I, um, I would like to conclude the first part of our meeting today. And I say goodbye to uh, Arthur. See you soon.